all uh, to another session uh, of lecture series. Uh, from today, we have uh, Dr. Suresh, uh, who is an internal medicine specialist and also is an uh, independent medical practitioner. He also teaches in uh, one of the renowned medical colleges in Malaysia and has experience of uh, now more than 10 years in internal medicine. Uh, so it's a, a big thing for us because he is here. Uh, he has accepted my invitation to come on the show. Uh, and definitely he will share his own views on usage of drugs um, and definitely that will add value to what happens with drugs when it comes to human beings, right? So we are all about clinical pharmacology here. So he is one of the best persons who can really talk about drugs. Uh, so thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. And um, uh, I welcome you. Thank you. Uh, so today's session is going to be on uh, hypertension, uh, clinical pharmacology of hypertension. In fact, it would be a series of lectures on um, uh, anti-hypertensive drugs and their usage in clinical practice. Uh, so Dr. Suresh, anything from your side? Yeah, I'm yeah, um, very happy to be a part of this uh, lecture series uh, as a video tutorial. It will be a great help to the medical students. Yeah. And uh, we are going to give a series of lectures like this and uh, I'm more interested to join this uh, lecture series. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Amaya. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Thanks for coming too. Thanks. Uh, anyway, so uh, so we start up with the session on anti-hypertensive drugs. Uh, so a bit on uh, what is uh, blood pressure and uh, how you define hypertension. So to start with, blood pressure is defined, as you all must be knowing, is the uh, pressure exerted on the vessel walls by the flowing blood. So actually it's a lateral pressure exerted on the vessel wall by the flowing blood. I leave it to Dr. Suresh to talk more on um, the recent uh, trends in uh, diagnosis and classification of uh, hypertension. Yeah. If you take the clinical diagnosis, the clinical definition of uh, hypertension, it is defined as a blood pressure of more than 140 by 90 on two or more uh, readings taken at uh, each of two or more visits. You know. Yeah. So uh, after the initial screening. We, need, we should not uh, come to a conclusion that uh, he is definitely hypertensive. So we should take at least two or more at least two or, uh, two more. Or more readings yes. and uh, it should show at least uh, out of those three visits, definitely two should be, two readings should be more than 140 by 90. Then only we call them as hypertensive patients. Yeah. And if you take the classification, uh, the clinical classification, they yeah. they, according to the recent uh, JMC7, uh, they classify the hypertension as stage 1 and stage 2. Yes. Stage 1 hypertension, uh, it is defined as systolic BP of more than 140 to 159 yes. in mercury. Yes. And diastolic BP of uh, uh, more than uh, 90 to 99 millimeters mercury. Yes. That is stage 1. Yeah. For stage 2 hypertension, if, uh, if it is more than systolic of more than uh, 160 millimeters mercury and diastolic of more than 100 millimeters mercury. Then we call it as stage, stage two. We stage two. Yeah. yeah. And so. this is as per the JNC Joint JNC. National Committee 8th report. Yeah, 8th eight, report. 8th report. Yeah. Uh, I think that everybody should uh, be following. It has yeah. been recently updated yeah. around uh, one or one and a half months back. Yeah. So we'll be following that onto our uh, thing. Uh, so anything on target levels of uh, JNC 7 on when you call that as hypertension? Yeah, uh, or when you want to treat actually hypertension? Actually, as per JNC7, yeah. uh, the target levels was, yeah, uh, yeah it was uh, decided to treat, uh, I mean, uh, to a target of BP less than 140 by 90. Yeah. Uh, in those patients who, had, who doesn't have any comorbid illnesses like uh, diabetes, uh, CK, I mean, chronic kidney disease, yes. or uh, dyslipidemia like yeah. that. Yeah. So uh, that is the target level as yeah. per JNC seven uh, yeah. guidelines. Yeah. And if they have, if they do have uh, the comorbid illnesses like di I mean diabetes or chronic kidney disease. Yeah. Then the target level as per JNC seven was reduced. I mean uh, was around one less than one thirty by eighty millimeters mercury. Yes. Th these two are the target levels for JNC seven, hmm. as per JNC seven. And now, uh, for as per JNC eight, they have. Uh, modified this target levels okay for uh, the treatment of the elderly patients yeah uh, the level target level was raised to 150 by 90 yeah 
and uh, if they have uh, diabetes uh, comorbid illnesses like diabetes or uh, chronic kidney disease yeah then the target level is uh, above 140 by 90 millimeters mercury yeah. So there is a bit of a difference between the JNC7 and the JNC8. Yeah, they, they have just raised the target levels, Yeah. Uh, thinking about other, uh, you know, outcome. Uh, Will it add to the confusion in the near future? Um, it is recently released in the December, yeah. December 2013, yeah. it was rele released recently. So but yeah. still uh, we need to uh, go a long way. Yeah whether uh, it is acceptable widely, yeah. universally. Yeah. So they are still uh, looking at it, but um, only JAMA, uh, the Journal of American Art, uh, Medical, As I mean, Medical Association, yeah. they have re recently released this uh, target level uh, for okay. JNC8. Yeah. But still it is it should be uh, universally accepted. Yeah. It has to go for it. Has to, it has, has to be tried and it tested. It has to be tried and tested uh, in the longer run. Yeah, because we just can't stop people from taking medicines, yeah. actually those who are uh, hypertensive and because they will be cut off if you increase the... We need to look at it yeah, in a different way. In a different way. In a different way. Try to mix and match and yeah. then let's see how the things happen. Yeah. So that was um, in short about um, how you will be diagnosing. So it's not just one time, but you need to do it for several times, blood pressure reading before you get to know that a patient is a hypertensive or not. And then uh, these are the target levels at which you want to treat a patient. Now, if that was about a uh, little bit on diagnosis and uh, uh, classification of uh, hypertension, the next thing that we will be talking of is groups of drugs that we usually uh, use for treatment of hypertension. So here we have ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, uh, in which we have a lot of drugs, enaropril, captopril, perindopril, ramipril, so on. So all prills will be under this list. We have then uh, angiotensin receptor blockers. So we have the gold standard drug like losartan in that. Yeah. Uh, but newer additions do come in. We have candy certain, it is certain. Certain. yeah, so, so a lot of things. Yeah. Huh? Uh, then we have calcium channel blockers, okay. So we have vasoselective calcium channel blockers, nifedipine, amlodipine, uh, which are also helpful in uh, treatment of hypertension. Uh, diuretics definitely have a role to play, especially with thiazide diuretics um, like uh, uh, chlorothiazide or hydrochlorothiazide which are also used um, in uh, mild hypertension. Uh, we will come to that <coughs> in a few uh, moments. We have beta blockers. Again, uh, we want to use uh, the ones which are cardioselective. So, atenolol and so on are the beta blockers that come under this list. We have alpha blockers. Uh, the gold standard would be prazosine. Again, uh, have a blocking action on alpha receptors uh, and do help in reducing blood pressure. And a few other vasodilatory drugs uh, like sodium nitroprusside, hydrolyzin, um, nitrates and so on. But we don't use them in general on a regular basis. We use them for specific conditions. So we won't be elaborating much on these drugs except when we come to prescribing of antihypertensives in specific conditions that we will be talking of these drugs. So you can see on the uh, screen now is the group of all these drugs which I talked uh, about. So just try to remember all these things uh, and the names preferably and the group because that is important when it comes to all about drugs and treatment of hypertension. So then we come to the core part of discussing drugs uh, in hypertension. So the first thing which comes to my mind uh, is, are the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitory drugs. Yeah. Um, so uh, Dr. Suresh can you elaborate on uh, when to use ACE inhibitors, what are the special things about ACE inhibitors and so on. So yeah. I'll leave it to Dr. Suresh. ACE inhibitors, uh, they are widely used in uh, uh, treating hypertensive patients. Yeah. And it is recognized as one of the first line therapy for uh, diabetic a patient who is also hypertensive yes uh, for various uh, advantages yeah <clears throat> and also for uh, non black patients you know. mm -hmm. uh, uh, and uh, the patient's age below 55 years yeah uh, this is considered to be uh, the best drug of choice for treating hypertension yes uh, but regardless of race uh, any all the patients with the diabetes and with also with chronic kidney disease, yeah. they should receive either ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers. Okay. 
for uh, treating the mild to moderate hypertension. Yes. Uh, because of the following advantages. Yes. Uh, first of all, it uh, uh, there is there is a lot of evidence to say that uh, uh, the AC uh, therapy uh, early initiation of AC therapy mm -hmm. has a potential to reduce the incidence of uh, type two diabetes uh -huh. in those who are uh, high risk subjects. Yeah. And it also has got some potential to reverse the incidence of diabetic nephropathy, yeah. uh, mainly by reducing the albuminuria or proteinuria. Yeah. And uh, it also reverses uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Yeah. And uh, it increases the wall to lumen <coughs> ratio of blood vessels mm -hmm. that occurs in hypertensive patients. Mm. And uh, it is safe uh, in asthmatic people. Mm -hmm. who are also hypertensive and mm -hmm. uh, who also have, uh, have peripheral vascular disease. Mm -hmm. uh, not only asthmatics but also in the chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't cause any uh, harm in those uh, patients by causing bronchospasm which is, mm -hmm. which is found in uh, beta blocker usage. Mm -hmm. So this is safer mm -hmm. uh, when compared to beta blockers mm -hmm. uh, when you treat the asthmatic hypertensives. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And uh, it does prevent some uh, secondary hyperaldosteronism, mm -hmm. and uh, when it also prevents the potassium loss mm -hmm. uh, when the patients are treated with uh, high ceiling diuretics like uh, furosemide. Uh, furosemide. Yeah. So it, it balances the the potassium level in the body. Yeah. And it doesn't have any hyperuricemia. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. So it is. Uh, it, it doesn't affect the plasma lipid profile mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. there is no uh, not much incidence in causing rebound hypertension mm -hmm. on withdrawing the AC inhibitor mm -hmm. just like we, we come across in alpha blockers or yeah. uh, uh, calcium channel blockers mm -hmm. there is no such incidence of rebound hypertension mm -hmm. and uh, it, it won't affect the quality of life you know the, mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, like uh, general well-being or yeah. if, uh, you know, nightmares yeah. uh, and then uh, work performance, it yeah. won't affect the sleep mm -hmm. and also the, the it will cause uh, importance on libido which is pronounced in other group of yeah. drugs like beta blockers. Yeah. And uh, it has got a protective effect on myocardial uh, cell remodeling yeah. and uh, vascular cell growth. Yeah. So, and, um, it, it overall it reduces the uh, cardiovascular disease and yeah. diabetic hypertensives mm. by improving the vascular endothelial function yeah so by by all these uh, advantages yeah uh, it is it is a perfect drug for uh, uh, diabetic patients uh, who, and many group of patients as i uh, uh -huh. as i told you yeah and uh, uh, but only problem is it, yeah it got actually some, yeah. Actually, it comes to it that uh, we need to know about some few side effects of these yeah. drugs. Uh, anyway, these are safe, tolerable drugs used widely, yeah. but that ends up into some side effects like hypotension, taste disturbances. Um, then we have dry cough. That's important. Uh, that basically occurs because um, it also inhibits the metabolism of bradykinin. So yeah. it accumulates and gives rise to dry cough. Yeah. In fact, that dry cough is what worries uh, the patients and that's why they come back to doctors saying that they have dry cough because that becomes an important side effect of these drugs. Yeah. Anyway, it has also impacts on um, calcium and so on. But because of this dry cough, uh, they're not calcium, potassium. Uh, so because of this dry cough, the important thing is that uh, the next group of drugs, in fact, were developed because they wanted, I mean, we wanted to prevent dry cough in people but still wanted to get all the benefits of uh, angiotensin receptor blocking action. So the next group of drugs is the ARBs or the angiotensin receptor blockers. As I told you, the examples are losartan. So I'll leave it to Dr. Suresh on a few tips on uh, losartan or ARBs in general. Yeah. ARBs have uh, the same indications as like uh, yeah. AC inhibitors. Yeah. Uh, the main advantages of ARB over AC inhibitors are uh, because of the lack of side effects as told by Dr. Ameya. Yeah. Like uh, they don't have cough, yeah. Uh, especially which is uh, very much pronounced uh, in many. I mean, around uh, four to five percent of people, yeah, they have dry, persistent cough, mm -hmm. mostly uh, nocturnal, sometimes uh, even in the day, mm -hmm. persistent cough, mm -hmm. and that that disturbs their, uh, you know, the, their work performance, their sleep. Yeah. Uh, so uh, 
in those uh, group of patients uh, after initiating this AC inhibitor if they develop cough then the, the best alternative uh, drug would be the ARBs yeah so uh, and no, and uh, we don't uh, come across much of discuss here I mean the, the taste disturbance mm -hmm. and one more uh, side effect which is pronounced with AC inhibitor uh, in larger uh, extent is <coughs> angioedema. Yeah, sorry. Uh, angi angioedema uh, uh, we find uh, off late, I mean, uh, not immediately after starting the AC inhibitor, but yeah. uh, maybe within some few days or a few yeah. weeks, we can uh, expect this complication as a side effect, you know, angioedema, yeah. uh, which can cause hypotension and other uh, problems of yeah. anaphylaxis. Yeah. So, uh, if those group of patients who have this. Uh, uh, potential of uh, the side effect yeah. can be uh, started on uh, this ARBs yeah. and uh, some studies they say that uh, ARBs have better tolerability pro profile mm -hmm. than uh, in patients with uh, diabetic nephropathy. Mm -hmm. uh, so with, this, with these advantages uh, mm, uh, we still prefer uh, ARBs yeah. in a certain degree of certain group of patients. Yeah. But uh, many, yeah, many, many trials have proved that AC inhibitors are uh, very good yeah. because many, many studies have been done with that uh, group of drugs. So, but ARBs, they, it's a better alternative in a certain group of patients which I told you, which I listed. Yeah. yeah. So it's 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 two way thing, isn't yeah, it? Either you want uh, AC inhibitors or you go on to ARBs. Yeah. So it all depends upon the physician's experience over the years that what he tries up and so yeah. on. But especially I have seen people changing drugs because of side effect profile, yeah. especially dry cough, they yeah. go on to ARBs and so on. Yeah. Uh, so there is one more thing which comes to my mind uh, when I talk of uh, angiotensin receptor blockers and we are still with this and with ACA inhibitors. That ACA inhibitors are also contraindicated in bilateral renal stenosis. Yes. That, that's one more yeah, indication. One more. Uh, just to Dr. Suresh, one more point comes to my mind. Anything with potassium that you need to be aware of when you are on AC inhibitor therapy? Yeah. Uh, if there is a, a hyperkalemia, yeah. existing hyperkalemia yeah. due to any cause, yeah. then uh, we need to monitor the potassium level yeah. before and uh, within two weeks after initiating uh, yeah. AC inhibitor therapy. Yeah. Uh, so if there is a rise of potassium level, it is better to uh, decrease or stop the drug and uh, go for another other alternative drugs like uh, calcium channel blockers or uh, beta blockers okay. and uh, we need to weigh the risk and benefit and the potassium if there is another drug which is also raising the uh, potassium level hmm. then we have to choose other alternative other drugs alternative. because potassium disturbance can affect the myocardial function uh -huh. and it can provoke uh, cardiac arrhythmias yeah. And not only that, uh, it suddenly it came to my mind that the potassium, I mean the AC inhibitors are not indicated in pregnancy patients. Yeah, because of, this, that yeah, because of the yeah, because of this uh, bilateral possibility of bilateral renal yeah. stenosis in the fetus. Yeah. So uh, these are yeah. the you have to weigh between the, the risk and the benefits. Benefit. So since it was two groups, two group of drugs with almost same kind of actions, we tried to pull it together. Yeah. on most of the things uh, on that and one more one more uh, yeah. which stri suddenly strike in my mind is uh, uh, ac inhibitors uh, very powerful vasodilators so yeah. it is better not to give in patients with aortic stenosis yeah lb lb uh, you know lb ot lb, yeah. LB outlet yeah. tract obstruction yeah so those conditions we need to uh, we need to, uh, to get to some get other to some other alternative drugs so, uh, just one last question, what is your preferred choice on ACA inhibitors out of the all drugs uh, that are listed with, you know, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, what's your choice of drugs from all these things? I prefer uh, uh, either analapril or ramipril. Ramipril, yeah. yeah. Ramipril is coming up like a huge, uh, I mean, it's yeah. coming up like a, a good drug yeah. in that list and I think uh, addition for the last five to six years. Yeah. But Many studies have used this uh, yeah. uh, ramipril. Yeah. So better to use a drug which is already trialed in many studies. Many studies. Yeah. yeah. But with ARBs? Uh, ARBs, uh, losartan. Losartan, yeah. losartan. Yeah. So uh, with that, uh, we come to the next class of drugs that is on calcium channel blockers. Uh, now, as you all know, calcium channel blockers um, are the uh, calcium is needed for contractions of muscles. So there are a lot of calcium channels in the body which 
bring in calcium from the outside inside the to inside of the cell we have the uh, l type of calcium channels t type of calcium channels leak channels which all bring in calcium so if we are in a position to block these channels by giving drugs we can create uh, artificial scarcity of calcium uh, inside the cells and can bring about uh, dilatation of the muscles um, i mean the relaxation of muscles which can give rise to uh, dilatation of vessels and which can bring down blood pressure so we have calcium channel blockers with us uh, we have a lot of groups under calcium channel blockers a few are uh, cardio selective calcium channel blockers uh, like velapamil but we will not be dealing with them but the more ones will be the vaso selective calcium channel blockers which can block the calcium channel blockers in the vessels and so affect the periphery so the group of drugs under this would be nifedipine amlodipine and so on so these drugs are i should say quick in action they are tolerated more uh, i mean well in elderly individuals yeah. as and they do not impair the physical work capacity of a person they neither cause sedation or any cns effect uh, cerebral perfusion remains uh, fairly constant with these drugs uh, they are not contraindicated in asthma and peripheral vascular disease uh, so that that comes as important thing to me uh, in fact few studies have also shown that they can reduce the incidence of, of stroke Yeah. Yeah. So that that's one addition point which goes with calcium channel blockers. Uh, they don't have any uh, negative effects with lipid profile of a person, uh, and they do not impair any renal perfusion. So that that that's it's good, also it's a good drug. It's in case of uh, uh, severe uh, chronic yeah, kidney disease. Yeah. In fact, it's a good drug. Good so drug, very good. Drug. Yeah. And it doesn't affect pregnancy. I mean, the fetus. So safe in pregnancy, safe in pregnancy and so on. Uh, so uh, and to add to it, what is that? They do not cause any problems with sexual functions also. Yes, of a yeah, person. in erectile dysfunction. In erectile uh, dysfunctions yeah, also. Uh, then uh, renal vascular hypertension. Yeah, yeah. Or renal artery stenosis. Yeah, is the best drug. Uh, yeah. to try. Yeah. So that note with beta blockers and not to add with CCBs. The next question to Dr. Suresh will be on uh, the use of beta blockers. You know, uh, widely talked drugs, but so controversial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But still a choice. You know, they. I mean, doctors love beta blockers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah so on beta blockers. Yeah. Beta blockers. Uh, though there are some uh, disadvantages, a lot of advantages. First, we will talk about uh, advantages. Yeah. beta blockers they are very good uh, in in case of uh, cardiac patients yeah. like uh, my, any patient who have coronary ischemia yeah angina and stable angina or uh, myocardial infarction yeah this is the best drug to control the, uh, the it's a dual effect first it will control the heart rate yeah then it will reduce the blood pressure yes so the patients uh, they do very well in the long term uh, outcome yeah Uh, when they are on beta blockers yeah and uh, but we have to be very selective in this uh, uh, choosing the, the cardio selective yeah. beta 1 blockers yeah so they if you want to avoid the side effects yeah so like the, uh, i mean the beta 1 uh, selective uh, like would be uh, uh, metoprolol yeah atinolol yeah so bisoprolol yeah. these drugs they do wonderful uh, uh, you know effects yeah Uh, especially on the uh, the cardiac uh, the function yes and uh, not only that uh, beta blockers uh, they are a very good choice uh, mm. in in uh, patients who are very much uh, having uh, having sympathomimetic driven uh, anxiety or yeah. you know, those who are very much tensed uh, mm. especially the, the type a individuals mm-hmm. so those kind of patients who, who do develop a uh, silent hypertension yeah uh, the beta blockers uh, they do very well mm-hmm. and those who don't have any other uh, uh, you know problems apart from anxiety induced or sympathomimetic mm-hmm. driven mm-hmm. uh, when when you give the beta blockers we need to look into the uh, contraindications and uh, side effects yeah Uh, it is the best drug uh, mm. when we give in the early stage of cardiac failure. Mm. Beta blockers they do they re- they reverse and they they control the the symptoms and signs of uh, yes. cardiac failure, especially in the stage one to stage three, stage three mm-hmm. A until yes. stage three A we can save we can still uh, titrate and uh, give the drug mm-hmm. beta blockers. Mm-hmm. But when when the patient uh, uh, st- becomes unstable. Yeah. and the develop and progresses to stage 3b and stage 4 uh, yeah. of uh, cardiac failure mm-hmm. uh, it should be gradually withdrawn and uh, 
it, it may prove deleterious if you uh, give this drug because yeah. it will uh, affect the cardiac function later yeah. in the stages yeah. of cardiac failure. Yeah. And it, it should not be given in pulmonary edema of mm. any cause. Mm. And uh, it is not a best, it is not a drug of choice in uh, in patients who have asthma, COPD, yeah. and peripheral vascular disease because of the, uh, you know, the cardio, I mean, bronchospasm. Bron <coughs> yes. Because if you give, if you give uh, a non selective beta blocker, yeah. Uh, since it uh, also uh, blocks the beta 2 receptors, yeah. it can cause a profound bronchospasm yeah. and it can precipitate asthma and COPD yeah. uh, exacerbation. So it is better not to give in those patients and it may cause uh, peripheral vascular occlusion yeah. because of beta 2 selective, beta 2 uh, uh, antagonist yeah. property. And uh, it, it, these beta blockers, they also have an unfavorable uh, effect on uh, lipid profile yeah. and also on uh, Glycemic. glycemic. glycemic uh, in fact, beta blockers are contraindicated to extend in diabetes. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, because they will mask the, all the sympathetic uh, yeah. active, uh, I mean, the signs yeah. of hypoglycemia. Yeah, it will cause hypoglycemic unawareness. Yeah, unawareness. And it can cause, uh, uh, you know, uh, glucose intolerance. Yeah. So it is not a good choice in a diabetic, severely diabetic patients. Yeah. yeah. But if they do have uh, cardiac uh, problems like angina and uh, like early stage of congestive cardiac failure, we can give a, a cardio selective beta blocker like atinolol. Yeah. And uh, when we talk about the quality of life uh, after starting beta blockers, mm. it affects the quality of life uh, to a certain extent, like uh, decreased work capacity, fatigue, yeah. uh, disturbed sleep uh, in the form of uh, nightmares, yeah. <coughs> and uh, low drive. Yeah. It may cause importance also, so it is better not to give in a young patient, yeah. young males who was who are not married and who don't have <laughs> children. Yeah. Uh, so it's better to uh, think about the serious problem. Yeah, serious problem. Yeah, if they do have if they have children, then uh, it's okay. But uh, we have to think about this when. Yeah. Then, then, but then also it comes to cultural issues, yeah, cultural where issues. you live and so on. So yeah. a lot of things associated even with those conditions. Yeah, and uh, if you take about the newer uh, beta-1 selective blockers, they don't uh, cause any postural hypotension, yeah. uh, they don't affect the bowel function, yeah. and they don't cause any uh, salt and water retention like uh, uh, like like seen in other groups yeah. like thiazides. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's the drug of choice in uh, in certain conditions, yeah. especially related to cardiac, cardiac problems. Cardiac problems. Cardiac problems. Yeah. And, uh, your choice on beta blockers? I prefer uh, either uh, metoprolol or yeah. atinolol. Bisoprolol is also is uh, a good is a very good drug. Uh, yeah. Once daily, uh, we can use uh, yeah. this bisoprolol. So yeah. it is turning out to be uh, the, one of the good drugs in cardiac patients. Yeah, yeah, still true. So with that, uh, I think the next group of drugs uh, we can start is thiazide diuretics. Yeah, before, thi before going, yeah. before going to yeah, yeah, just one, one, one more, one more thing yes. about beta blockers. Yeah, uh, beta blockers and AC inhibitors so they are most effective drugs uh, to prevent sudden cardiac death. Yeah, that is what. Yeah, in especially in uh, my, in post EMI patients. Yeah, and uh, those who are hypertensive with yeah. uh, stable heart failure. Yeah. So. The sudden death, yeah, sudden, sudden, sudden that, death. that's important yeah. rather I should say, yeah, very death, important. Yeah. It prevents yeah. sudden cardiac death, uh, these yeah. two drugs, these beta two blockers and AC inhibitors. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that was uh, interesting on beta blockers, yeah. so many uh, value added education with beta blockers. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next group of drugs is thiazide diuretics. Um, hydrochlorothiazide um, is the one uh, that we usually use and so on. It's a weak acting um, antihypertensive drug. Uh, it has action on I think the calcium and or sodium and chloride uh, port transporter pump. Uh, Sim port pump I should say in the distal convoluted tubules of the nephron so it inhibits that uh, which causes weak and uh, diuresis and gives rise to uh, antihypertensive action. It's beneficial in elderly individuals, I think, yeah. we, uh, we will talk of thiazide diuretics. Uh, but it's a low-grade uh, antihypertensive drug and the maximum therapeutic potential with hydrochlorothiazide dose comes to around 25 milligrams per day. Yeah. So that is what you can give it maximum, uh, beyond that maybe it's not effective with that. 
uh, anyway uh, with these kind of drugs postural hypotension is not an issue but uh, antihypertensive effect will be lost if uh, you know patient takes in a lot of salts okay so even if you are adding a salt to your diet then it will uh, nullify the effects of a diuretic drug uh, it mediates a weak diuretic action and over a period of time it will decrease the peripheral vascular resistance so that's the macroscopic way of how it will be acting as an antihypertensive drug uh, but there are few side effects with thiazide diuretics, uh, definitely glucose intolerance, uh, problems with lipid levels of an individual, um, hypokalemia, uh, not so profound as that we get with low uh, loop diuretics or the high ceiling diuretics, but anyway it can occur with even thiazide if you use for a longer period of time, hyperuricemia and uh, some erectile dysfunctions in males. Yeah. So, uh, I mean that's the picture of thiazide diuretics, so weak diuretic for maybe mild hypertensive individuals uh, and so on, so elderly, so there we can think of thiazides. Anything from your side Dr. Suresh? Uh, it's the best drug uh, in an elderly hypertensive yeah. uh, because of, uh, uh, because of uh, slow onset of action and mm. uh, you know, but only problem is uh, it may cause a bit of dehydration. dehydration. So we need to uh, closely uh, follow yeah. uh, elderly people who yeah. are uh, who are living in the hot I mean hot con hot climates. Yeah. So we we just have to uh, find whether they uh, they are actually suitable for for this kind yeah. of drug. So the, yeah. I mean the weather conditions. Weather yeah, conditions. that's a very good point, isn't it? Where to use uh, these drugs? In fact. We are talking more in terms of drugs and climate now. Yeah, climate, yeah. <laughs> we need to select this, yeah. the group of patients who are actually, if they are in the cold climate, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, and one more thing is it may cause some, some sort of uh, tiredness because of the hypokalemia. Yeah. And, uh, fatigue will Fatigue, be. fatigue, especially fatigue. Yeah. So we need to remind the patients about this possible, I mean, possible uh, yeah. side effect. Yeah. But it's a weak, 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 side, weak, weak side effect. Yeah. So, uh, it's tolerable. Yeah, tolerable. It depends on the tolerable yeah. to of the level of the patients. Yeah. So if that was on thiazide diuretics, uh, let's move on to the next class of drugs on alpha blockers. Uh, so alpha blockers, basically, uh, as you know, alpha receptors uh, are the ones which causes vasoconstriction. It's an adrenergic receptor type. So we have beta and alpha. So alphas would be the one which would cause vasoconstriction. And so you block those alpha receptors, you then call it as these drugs are alpha blockers. Uh, again, the examples would be prazosin in this case. We have anyway other exam other group of drugs also in this group, uh, other drugs also in this group, sorry. So it's one of the choice of drugs in elderly with uh, prostatic hypertrophy and with peripheral vascular disease. So you use alpha blockers in these two conditions with hypertension. Uh, again, it's also recommended for uh, as antihypertensive if the other drugs are not working. So if you, you know your ACE inhibitors or ARBs or calcium channel blockers are not working, you can add on with a prazosine or alpha blocker. It might work for refractory hypertension or resistant, uh, resistant hypertension or in fact hypertension comes with chronic kidney disease. Yeah. Uh, you can use a alpha blocker. Uh, as addition I should say, it yeah. will prove to be its of its value in that case. Um, I should say it's, it, it, uh, it has a favorable effect on lipid profile, yeah. uh, especially with LDL and triglycerides. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I should say uh, it improves in carbohydrate metabolism, it's suitable for diabetics, uh, not if neuropathy is present. So postural hypotension is accentuated and uh, that's where we call of side effects side of effects. these drugs. In fact, I could say first dose effect is most important side effect with uh, uh, alpha blockers. Yeah. So one should be careful while administering the first dose of uh, alpha blocker to individuals. A uh, few other side effects would be uh, like headache, uh, drowsiness, dry mouth, uh, palpitations, uh, fluid retention to extend minimal but can cause impaired ejaculation. So uh, that are few things which come to our mind when we talk of uh, they are alpha. Very, very rare. Very rare. But the first dose effect is what uh, is, is a pronounced one and need to be known uh, when you are talking of alpha blockers. So Postural hypotension yeah. is the main, main thing. Main thing. We need to yeah. look into the. Yeah, yeah, in fact. So uh, that was all on drugs and uh, hypertension. So we just talked of uh, where you can use which drugs. I hope it proves to be its own value. I thank Dr. Suresh for coming in our show and adding value to it, giving a lot of information on drugs. 
um, so I end today's session with that and we will meet the next time with um, uh, prescriptions on uh, uh, hypertension so I hope you like this session please click uh, the like button do subscribe to the channel thank you